Aloha, Nira Shaimase. Welcome to Sub Sapporo Dosanko Life. This is Chad and Jamie hanging in Sapporo, Japan. Thanks for joining us. If you're back and like what you heard, please support us and hit that subscribe button. Mahalo. All right, episode 26. Okay, 26. Yes, All right, joining us is Mr. David Orange from Alabama. Alabama. Wow. So, can, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Just a kind of self introduction. I, I was, re- I, I know some things about you, but I don't want to mess it up. So, yeah, well, uh, I grew up in Birmingham uh, in the outlying areas uh, during the civil rights era, you know, the uh, oh. 10 years after the Hiroshima bombing uh, and through this whole area when they called it Bombingham because of all the dynamite uh, being blown up. Uh, in the black communities uh, well, by the plan, And uh, so, uh, yeah, my father was very uh, in the midst of that, in the thick of it. And he went to the FBI Academy and was trained uh, as a sheriff's deputy. Uh, and they had, he was a liaison with the FBI. And so they were wow. breaking up the, uh, the Klan uh, and they were having trouble with uh, the Panthers and dealing with the marchers and putting people in jail. And then, you know, they wanted to leave jail. You know, so uh, it, was a, it was a very clever use of uh, overweighting the system that was trying to hold them down. And so they had to let them all go or they wouldn't any of them leave, you know. So, yeah. Uh, and then growing up with this county assistant sheriff, uh, I was exposed to all these, uh, every kind of uh, law enforcement and physical uh, social situation. And I had some access and began training in martial arts and started in karate with Kyokushin and uh, nice. had that up with and uh, with a Marine, a uh, former Marine, who was wow. a tough guy uh, who really talked it like a machine and uh, went on and uh, learned Aikido uh, beginning in 1974 because I understood that it would allow you to defend yourself and uh, yet not really harm the other person more than necessary to stop you. So uh, I was uh, really motivated to learn to defend myself and not break people up. Um, So uh, I went on and uh, trained in Aikido for quite a while and uh, lived in Japan for five years. uh, And 21 months of that, I was with, uh, I was Uchideshi with Minoru Mochizuki in uh, Shizuoka. And he had been Uchideshi to Morihei Weishiba. Uh, and uh, and he was also his assistant when they taught uh, the military at the Naval Academy of Japan in uh, 1930 when he would when he began to train with Weishiba. So uh, his uh, Aikido uh, was influenced by that army, uh, the, the Navy, the military style uh, that they were doing. And I found out that during that time he was teaching at the Naval Academy, the uh, prime minister uh, was assassinated. And uh, wow. so it was not a, you know, laid back, you know, or time uh, in, to be in Tokyo or in Japan at all. And uh, it was a very heavy duty situation. And so he was teaching military at that time. And uh, so uh, that kind of Aikido was always uh, for personal protection and to dominate an attacker instantly. Yeah. So that's the kind of background I came from. Uh, and it, it clicked. I liked uh, the early and, uh, and everlasting emphasis on uh, self-defense and especially against a, a smaller person against a larger person mm-hmm. and the, uh, the ethic of not doing more uh, than is necessary to stop them because then you're the one uh, who uh, is committing violence. Uh, the teacher I mentioned, the, the Kyokushin man, who was uh, the Marine, uh, who was a county deputy, uh, had an incident in which he arrested a man who was uh, drunk and disorderly. He, he pulled out a knife and uh, the sergeant disarmed him and was taking him to his car when the other three guys all attacked him and tried to free the prisoner. And they all went to the hospital over the hill. Uh, And uh, (laughs) wow. And I uh, talked to the guy who was a security guard that night when they came in. And uh, he said that you could just see that somebody had just 
torn them up. And, uh, and this, uh, this man was put on trial uh, for that. Uh, and he, uh, he injured all four of them pretty heftily. And as a county deputy, uh, they put him on trial and he was uh, acquitted. You know, but, uh, and, and whatever happened there couldn't have taken more than, you know, about a minute and a half. Uh, but uh, the thing about self-defense is you can be uh, tried for whatever you do. Yeah. Even if you are a legal officer or, you know, especially if you're not, mm. uh, if you go too far, then it's uh, not only is it not Budo, you know, but it is a uh, potential to put you in prison. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I've always come from being aware of that side because my father uh, was you know, involved in training hundreds of men uh, to be uh, police officers and to arrest people under bad circumstances. Hmm. So uh, he had a way about him. Uh, and so I just kind of followed through with that kind of approach to things. Uh, and uh, while we diverged on some politics, uh, nonetheless, I believe that there's uh, you know, justice and when when it's necessary, you, you need to step in and deal yeah. with things. Yeah. So, Do you think um, growing up with that background, it, it uh, steered you towards Aikido because it emphasized kind of not hurting them where you grew up with like the clan and stuff and seeing all of that, did that play a part? Uh, yes, uh, uh, and the first martial arts really that I learned uh, was from a manual from the FBI Academy uh, that was uh, arresting techniques and it showed a lot of uh, jujitsu basically and, uh, and I started looking at that and it showed a pistol disarming technique that I uh, used over the decades after that and uh, refined some technique. Uh, but uh, the, the self-defense uh, was a thing that was uh, big for me, I guess, uh, you know, uh, the kids, you know, were kind of pushy. It was wartime. It was the time of the Vietnam War and uh, a lot of things were going on. Uh, so I had been in a couple of little scraps and uh, three little schoolyard fights with friends. Uh, and uh, I wanted to be more in control of whatever I might wind up doing, you know, in these fights and not keep getting these big black eyes, you know. And, uh, <laughs> understood, understood. So, so actually um, living in uh, Alabama during that time must've been really, I mean, I, I mean, it's, a lot of unfortunate things were happening, but it was really interesting at the time because, uh, you know, it's, uh, civil rights, lots of changes. What were some like things that you saw and experienced during, uh, growing up in Alabama during, um, was that 50s, 60s, 60s? Uh, I was born in 55. And uh -huh. uh, so all of the things that were happening in the civil rights uh, movement there were happening in areas that I, you know, recognized when they were on TV mm -hmm. and in the newspapers. And, uh, and my father was out in the park while the, uh, Birmingham city police and fire people were hosing the uh, black marchers. Wow. And, uh, he was uh, not in that department. Uh, there was a whole political thing that went there and uh, he was more, uh, he was coordinating with the FBI at that time to kind of try to keep things from exploding. Uh, so he was there in the park uh, and uh it was a very dangerous time. People would disappear, you know, and never be seen again. Wow. They talked about the Klan. And, yeah. Uh, so wow. it was, uh, everybody had to be watching out because the police also were just completely infiltrated with Klan. And uh, that was also the time of the Red Scare and uh, spies everywhere, uh, which... Uh, Birmingham was actually a kind of a hot spot for CIA. They uh, operated out of the Birmingham airport. They were on the Bay of Pigs invasion. Those were uh, 
people from around Birmingham. The, the planes flew out of Birmingham when they went to attack the, uh, the Cubans at the Bay of Pigs. Wow. But, uh, you know, Birmingham, uh, the missile crisis and all that, uh, we were sitting here and uh, the FBI was moving into the law enforcement uh, organizations and training people and coordinating with them uh, on their local levels. Uh, saw a lot of scientific advances and things uh, in the moonshot and all that. You know, so it's time wow. to grow up. Bruce Lee was my big hero. I didn't know his name. Uh, Kato on the Green Hornet. You know. Yeah, so yeah. I, I wanted to be like that. And, uh, but uh, you have to learn that uh, kind of thing, uh, that way of kicking. Uh, but anyway, uh, that was... Uh, where I got very interested in doing that. And uh, over the some years, I did uh, get more uh, practical and uh, real training in those things. Mm -hmm. um, but I always wanted to uh, know that this was going to work in self-defense and I wasn't going to be interested otherwise. Mm. It might look good, but you know, if it wasn't. Uh... And self-defense is uh, an important thing that you uh, you have uh, only a limited range of choices. If you get into a ring and fight, you've agreed to get in there and fight. Uh, yep. And uh, self-defense is a time when you don't get a choice and it's a criminal act. And criminals will uh, plan their activities and they'll plan their traps. Like uh, a football coach, you know, writes and draws the line and the arrow and you go around there. Uh, criminals do something similar. They practice these uh, techniques. And uh, so I think we wanted to talk about Aikido as self-defense. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Well, so uh, say if you're taking uh, any kind of martial art you want to name and uh, you are driving on a highway and you stop uh, at uh, you're down here you might stop at the waffle house and waffle you house go in you know and you you uh use the restroom you get some coffee or something you come back and it's night and you've just had to take this short break and there's two guys sitting on the hood of your, uh, the car next to your car and as you uh start to approach one of the guys uh kind of gets off the hood and goes down between the two cars and looks out across the parking lot and so you think, okay, I'm going to get in my car and just get on out of here. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you're occupied with your door, the guy starts coming back toward you. And he has a knife. And you look back, and here comes the other guy, and he has a gun. Yeah. So you're not only between the guy with the knife and the guy with the gun. They had some wild video uh, about how you get out of that position, you know. A guy on one side of the end, uh, <laughs> but here you're also between two cars, you know, it's very narrow space and nobody can really see what's happening back there. And they're just telling you, be quiet, give me your money, you know, a knife behind you, a gun in front of you. And so, uh, what martial art would you choose to use at that moment? And Run fetal food. position. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Run food. <laughs> yeah. Take what you want, sir. I'll live. Yeah, to, yeah. I'll live another day. <laughs> Take my money. So, uh, so that's something that they pull off on people all the time, you know. And um, is there a way out of that situation? That sounds pretty intense. <laughs> like, what do you do? Well, that's a plan. That's a plan robbery. That's how people. That's how criminals yes. like get. You know, get get things. They they plan this stuff out. It's not just like. They don't just randomly like they go up to people and like pull a gun and they have they pre-plan this stuff right yeah they pre-plan it and they watch yeah. and they look for the right time yeah and uh maybe one will uh, distract you and then suddenly the other's there uh or it's if it's only one guy you know and he's coming up to you there's the levels uh, of uh is he armed or unarmed and everything but in the case just mentioned this actually happened to me and uh Wow. What? They tried it. And uh, so I came out of this place and the two guys are sitting on the hood of, my, of their car next to my car. And uh, the one closest to my car 
gets up and as he stands up, he, I see he opens a knife and he goes down between the two cars. And I, uh, went in with, uh, I, he was passed, but I turned like this, uh, and was on the sidewalk like that. And the guy sitting on the other car is still waiting there. And he looks at me and, uh, and I'm looking down between the cars and I thought that guy's going to go to the end of the car and he's going to turn around. He's going to have that knife. And he did. And, and I just thought, okay, this is what's happening. I'm going to go down there and try to get in the car. He's going to come in behind me. And now I'm between these two guys. And so I'm, uh, on the sidewalk. I didn't go between the two cars. And that comes from a self-defense awareness that, uh, yep. that, uh, I had never heard of a plan like this, but when it started into action, uh, because of every, every practice, every practice, every move is self-defense precision. And, mm -hmm. uh, it, it builds this into your nervous system that you instantly react. And so then, uh, I came out of this stance and put my hands down and uh, there was this little moment there. And the plan was, well, this is a guy with a knife. If he comes toward me, I'm going to back fist the guy on the car and knock him off the car and get his gun and shoot the guy with a knife. And, uh, and so neither one of them moves <laughs> and it's like, okay, what are we going to do? You know? And, and they're like, we're leaving, you know, they didn't say anything. They just left. And, uh, so that is Aikido, uh, because, uh, it put me just ahead of where they had planned to, to be. Uh, I also didn't, didn't, didn't go into the pit and get locked down there, but I was a step ahead of where they wanted to come out after their success, you know, and, uh, and now they were in trouble to a degree in that, uh, I was going to knock that guy out for sure and be in a position that, um, uh, I would better be able to deal with the other guy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so there, there was no, um, no physical altercation. You just position yourself no. in a way that right. uh, messed them up. So right. uh, they, they felt uncomfortable and just left. They, yes. they realized that you knew what was yeah. going to happen. So that, yeah. that foiled their plan. So preemptively, yeah. they knew, oh, okay, this guy's this guy not a, a pansy. This guy's not, a, um, so this guy's not this, somebody to be messing It basically with. started way like before because of your positioning. Like you planned yes. everything. I see. Uh, and uh and it's just an improvisation from the moment there mm -hmm. and that's also the thing is aikido always lets you improvise into whatever they're giving you and uh so if it doesn't take you know a violence uh then if you don't do any violence then it's budo mm -hmm. if it takes a little bit of a uh, strong arm and you give them just a little bit you know but best really is you just tell them, you know, and they, they do it. Uh, and if you have that kind of uh, self-possession uh, uh, with those particular people, you know, because you run into a lot of different kinds of people and they all react differently. Yep. So, uh, yeah. But to have trained every move with the idea that uh, this could someday save my life. And yeah, that's yeah. why I'm, I'm practicing this. Uh, yeah, your and, intention, right? Yes, and, and training with people who who understood how it's actually applied when violence is attempted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you didn't physically like move the the what do you call that? The formation, the momentum. You didn't physically move the momentum, but you kind of like uh, what is that? Like situationally move yeah. the momentum and kind of like curved and steered things in a way. So it's kind of it like Aikido. Yeah, I kind of pinned their movement because the guy is going to walk down to the end of the car and yeah. look, and then he's going to turn around and take two steps forward. But he turns around and uh, there's nothing there. Yeah, And yeah. it's a little bit like when you see Okamoto get somebody, uh, you know. Yeah, Okamoto, uh, yeah. 
he turns and whoop, he's like, I can't move. I can't step because he didn't go. And uh, so he's kind of suspended there. Mm-hmm. You know, you see Okamoto put somebody up. He's suspending yeah. them there for that moment. Yeah. Uh, and so Ike is like they come to some stairs. And when they put their foot on the first stair, it gives way. And they start to fall and they put their hand on the rail and it breaks and then it leads them uh, up or down. They're going to hang on to it, you know. Uh, they have no choice, right? Yes. And they they, uh, they basically fall into a trap with it. And then their uh, reactions, uh, they just go into uh, escape or like uh, pulling at straws, you know. Yep, yep. Uh, they they grab whatever will give them any feeling of support, hmm. uh, and that's the moment uh, that we really want to give them an IQ. Uh, and it's uh, you know that kind of thing you don't get a chance for something like that in a ring uh, because you know. Uh, also, the training for the ring may leave you a little bit uh, uh, disregardful of uh, all the potentials, you know, because there will uh, often be uh, multiple people and they will have weapons, hmm. uh, and blades and guns. Yeah. And Situation is different. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so having uh, the Aikido being based on sword, uh, you don't want to really try to put it into the ring and try to test it that way. Uh, When you actually come into a place that it's self-defense, you know, you are minding your own business and somebody comes to uh, rob you in some way. Uh, Or if it's a female, possibly to rape or to just overpower uh, and uh, to exert their will against somebody else and uh, usually to take your money. uh, But uh, so if you resist, they may well try to kill you. uh, But your reactions need to be uh, such that you can avoid uh, being attacked. uh, and avoid the fight. Because uh, T- Takeda Sokaku said the art of Aiki is to overcome the opponent mentally at a glance mm. and win without fighting. Yeah. So that's kind of like that. Uh, but uh, Morihei Weishpa said Aikido kills the attacker at a single blow. So there's that side of it too. Um, yeah. And they're both valid uh, and they're both factual. Uh, so they had him teaching at the Naval Academy. Hmm. And, and those Naval guys, they, that, that was hardcore. That was like you, you do self-defense for, for killing, basically, or you basically kill yes. the opponent, right? Yes, it was. Uh, Incapacitating, right? Yeah, and, and his Aiki Jiu-Jitsu at that time uh, was not, uh, I guess it's go no sin. He attacks and you do your defense. Uh, if you watch Weishiba in those days, Weishiba – does the first move. He, yeah, he, he attacks first. Yeah. Attacks the guy. And when the guy makes a defensive move, then he turns that into Daito View uh, technique. Uh, but uh, you're minding your own business. You're doing the right thing. You see someone you love, uh, or you just see some weak person on the street that's being uh, abused, and you feel that you need to do something about it. Uh, or you're just walking down a street and you realize that someone's been following you uh, for half a block and it's not the best part of town. Mm. And you realize, okay, uh, that is getting to be a self-defense situation. And where this is uh, very different from uh, ring type fighting. uh, And, you know, uh, the Yosekan was always a mixed martial art being Aikido, Judo, Karate, uh, and Sword, and Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, and he began blending all those arts together pretty early on. They were just for him, they were all the same thing. Yeah. Uh, so when you're being approached by someone like that, uh, that's following you down the street and you don't know exactly what, 
uh, then you begin to lead them just by your small movements, whether they know you can detect them or not. Hmm. They come to have an idea. I'm going to walk up and hit him. And, uh, but then you move in a certain way, and this is just not a good move for that, yeah. for that new position. Yeah. And so they have to change as they're approaching. Yeah. And as they're coming in, you're putting a little burden on them by making them adjust and adjust. And uh, then when you face them, and it's you know clear that this is uh, the situation, then they have to decide, are they going to attack? Yeah. Uh, now, this uh, Aikido that uh, came from Mochizuki Sensei, uh, as I say, he had uh, assisted Ueshiba in training the Naval Academy. Uh, after that training ended, he was shot, not, not physically, uh, he, was, he got sick, he had pleurisy, and he had to go to the uh, hospital for some three to six months, and Jigoro Kano paid for it, and uh, and he went back and it left him with scarring on his lungs and he was not able to join the military because of that. Uh -huh. So it was fortunate. Uh, it saved his life probably because they just threw everybody off the cliff, uh, you know, and didn't really, uh, cannon fodder basically. Right. Yeah. And, you know, a guy like that and lots of great karate and Aikido men and swordsmen were just thrown away like that. Yeah. And, uh, so Machizuki became a, a, a political figure and became a, a deputy governor uh, in Mongolia. And, oh, wow. uh, and he was there for, I guess, eight years. And uh, in that time, the Russians, the Americans, the Chinese uh, all had interest in there and there was a lot going on. And he did a lot of things with his, uh, uh, by putting out uh, medics to surround the cities. And whenever the local people had problems, they would go to the medics and get treatment. And whenever uh, enemies would be moving in close to the cities, someone would tell the doctor and the doctor would send a runner and they would notify and go out of the cities and make these enemies before they got into the cities and cause a lot of damage you know, in town. So uh, this is uh, the kind of uh, thing that much as if you can say uh, thought like. Uh, so when the example is that you're uh, walking down the street and this person is approaching, there's a process that happens when uh, a person decides to attack you. And now this is outlined uh, from uh, a report done by Captain uh, Thomas E. Bearden of the U.S. Army uh, at, Ars at uh, Redstone uh, in the mid-1960s. And he broke down uh, from a military perspective what Aikido is mm. based on what uh, Captain Demizu taught him. And Demizu was Machizuki Sensei's uh, son-in-law because he had married Machizuki Sensei's daughter. And he was well-versed in Aikido and he taught this art and uh, Bearden wrote this manual explaining what Aikido is and what it does. And a lot of what it does uh, is that it disintegrates a person's internal uh, orientation, correct, uh, coordination. And uh, uh, the example is that uh, they see you in front of them and they decide I'm going to punch him in the stomach. And so the, the mind decides I'm going to punch him in the stomach. And then it directs and the spirit jumps on that. And uh, as soon as the spirit jumps on the body's going to come immediately. So the mind decides the spirit locks on the body attacks. So uh, this is what this captain in the army wrote. That's how it happens. And uh, after training with Demi Zoo, so uh, the Aikido person then allows the uh, attacker to mentally scope him out and allows him to choose his target and allows him to put his spirit into attacking that target and then he moves the target. So at that moment when the spirit latches on, then he moves the target and the attack launches because it's too late. Uh, the body follows the spirit. And so 
What we do then is we move with a tie sabaki. That's how we move the target. We move the body out of the line of the attack. So he, he begins to attack. We move the target. And this also makes him, we move out of his peripheral vision. He can't see us now. And uh, it's good if we can turn his body. And so he was looking at us and then he's, we were gone and he's been turned. And now he's looking at something that just one split second before he had no idea. And now he's looking at it thinking, what is that? Why am I, why did I come in here? You know, why did I come in this room? Whenever you get that feeling, somebody just did Aikido and, and got out, you know. Is that uh, different from controlling someone with footwork or is it well, a it, kind it's, of movement? The footwork is part of it uh, in that when he uh, settles on how he's going to attack you and he attacks and you're not there anymore. And if he can lead you forward and also turn you, then you're now looking uh, at something you weren't looking at. And uh, he was looking at you and you're gone. You're, you're out of his peripheral vision. And you have moved up beside him, but then turned him. So basically you're behind him. And it's, uh, you can do that with one step. And uh, there are five of these Taisabaki steps that Mochizuki Sensei taught. And they're all to uh, get you out of the attack, but leave you close enough that you can uh, counter attack. And you see boxers, uh, they're really well aware of this distance. Um, mm -hmm from which you can hit somebody or not. And in Aikido, we always, before we do any paired practice, we check my eye by putting out our hands and when our fingertips touch, then we have a distance where I can't kick or punch him, he can't kick or punch me. But if we move one step forward, we can hit each other. Yeah. The range changes. So I think, I think you were kind of like talking about like kind of controlling kind of like leading the person, right? You lead, you, you control the person by leading them preemptively before they, be, yes. before they move, right? Yes. And you bring them into this situation where now they are uh, either going to attack you or not. Yeah. And you, you brought them into a point where you're facing them. And then you give them this opportunity where you're uh, still and you let them find their target on you and then they, the mind decides, the spirit latches on, and they attack. And just at that moment, you've moved the target out of the way, and you've turned them. And this has broken up their body momentum. It's still going the way it was going, but their body has been turned to a new direction. So the body momentum and the, and the physical body are separated. The spirit is still going where it was going when it latched onto your movement. Uh, with the addition that uh, and to whatever degree it can follow, it has followed your body around, uh, although his body has turned away and his mind is looking at the new scene, trying to figure out what he's looking at, while the spirit has gone this way and the body momentum is that way. So he's off balance, but he has no coordination between his mind, his body, and his spirit. Mm -hmm. And he's okay. in a kind of a neutral gear. He's just there idling for a second not knowing what to do. So this is a moment where he's uh, completely blanked out and has no ability to respond. And so at that moment, you can throw him in any way under the sun. Uh, and you can uh, affect someone with this, uh, but it only lasts for a moment. So uh, you can see someone like Okamoto will get people in, in, uh, in Hodikawa will hold them uh, for several seconds. Uh, but Typically, if, if you can get someone in that suspension, then it's good for just a heartbeat or two. Yeah. And you better have a technique done by that time. Mm -hmm. So you get him in the suspension and you follow through with the self-defense uh, application. It can be from judo. It can be technical Aikido. It can be karate. Uh, you, know, you can do any technique that puts him into uh, an immovable position. And Mochizuki Sensei loved all the groundwork and the various pins. Uh, yeah. He loved to work those. Uh, but uh, if you are in this position uh, and someone uh, has come to this moment of wanting to attack you, then if you've been leading them already as they approached and you move small movements like a half step and they lose their 
opportunity for the attack they thought they would do and they have to change and so on, uh, then you uh, see that uh, you're already leading them and you uh, have this opportunity now to lead them in a very big way. Uh, are, are you leading them from a non-striking distance? Yes, you begin already before they're able to get up into the Ma'ai range where they're one step and hit you. You know, mm -hmm. a boxer, see, will be at the edge and he'll step forward and cross and he'll get back out and he'll, mm -hmm. you know, put his head in and he'll get his head back out. But with Aikido, we, we come in and uh, then we're inside there and uh, we're not trying to get back out. We're there to get him, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is uh, where. Most Aikido people don't even know about this. Uh, yeah. They wait for him to. Uh, so it's, it's not a question, does Aikido work? It's does uh, your Aikido work and, and how deep <laughs> is it? And there are people yeah. out there yeah. who have got it and will be gladly uh, show you how it's uh, properly done. And, uh, you know, rather than try to reinvent it for yourself, uh, you should go ahead and find somebody that really knows how to do it. And Yeah, you know, I agree. Yeah, totally. So have actually, seen, it looks like. Oh, 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 no, have, have you seen any of this applied in a, a ring or prize fighting? Or, uh, well, you know, you see the vestiges of these techniques all the time. One I really like is uh, Takanoyama, uh, the sumo guy. They get down, and the other guy is really big. And Takanoyama is a uh, fairly small guy. He's real strong, but uh, the the signal goes, and uh, they both launch. But Takanoyama slides to the side. And the other guy shoots right out of the ring, you know. Uh, so it's uh, you know, somebody says, "Oh, there's no touch uh, throws. That's impossible," you know. And I said, "Well, what is this?" And put that clip on there, you know. He, he was that Polish guy, right? Yes. Or, or he's a Polish uh, sumo wrestler, right? Yeah, I don't know what rank he got to, but to me, he was top rank. Yeah. Yoko's yeah, that, there's a famous gif of him. Yeah. Sup, sup, horo, dosanko life. All right. Let's go. All right, welcome back. <laughs> Good to be back. Yes. All right, so uh, as I understand, you've lived in Japan for a while. Like how long Five have years. you lived in Japan? Five years? Where? where? Uh, in Shizuoka. Shizuoka. So what was it like living in Japan? What were you doing there? What brought you here? You can you tell us about uh, it? To train with Mochizuki Sensei in um, Gyozegan, uh, so that was my primary motivation. And uh, get out of uh, Alabama for a while, you know, and uh, yeah. yep. learn Chinese. I'm a Japanese language, uh, and read the Chinese characters, and I learned some of that. Um, but uh, so, actually, what what year did you did you leave and, and go to Japan? Uh, I showed up in Japan in February of 1990. Oh, nice. So that's 30 years. Uh, and almost that was right at, right at the end of the economic bubble, I think, right? But yeah, pretty much. And uh, it was still going pretty well for me. Uh, I was teaching English. Uh, As and I, like we all do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got, I got a job pretty quickly. Uh, and uh it was a pretty good school and it has actually affected everything since then. It's uh, Dr. Robert Lado, L-A-D-O, and it was Lado International College. I don't know if it exists anymore. Mm -hmm. He was professor emeritus of linguistics at Georgetown and he was a real pioneer in the post-war English education in J Japan. Oh, wow. Uh, and, uh, and he had this really interesting theory of uh, learning that uh, all learning of any subject uh, goes through five stages. And the first is just raw experience. Uh, and so like you hear uh, a language and you see it uh, written, but it has no meaning, but then you start remembering certain patterns uh, and you start realizing that they have a meaning. And uh, at some point you may or not co connect the, the written part with the sound. Uh, uh, gradually you do, but uh, the raw experience and then remembering parts of it. Uh, and then the next is uh, uh, assimilating the parts you know, along with this new bit that you just picked up. And then uh, it's the getting the pattern of using it uh, correctly. 
And then you go out in the real world and use it. That's the fifth stage of learning. When you go out and actually do something with it and it works. Uh, Application. Yeah. And even if you make a mistake, you learn to correct it, but you're close. You're, you're getting there. You, you're learning the language and you're living in the language and doing the language at that point. Mm. So it's all, mm. you know, even native speakers have to question each other about what they meant. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. and, uh, and, and they have to explain, you know, and go back and forth. So yeah. I realized that at some point and realized that I could uh, relax about learning uh, a language. And, what, uh, what was it like, um, like coming from Alabama and then going to Japan? Yeah, that's a great like, question. Did you get any culture shock or anything like that? Well, yes. Uh, I mean, I, I had spent all this time uh, kind of immersed in the Japanese thinking in a way, but, you know, it was idealized through the lens of the uh, martial arts uh, literature yep. Uh, that was available, uh, the, the magazines and things like that that you could get. Uh, so still, uh, I, I began at an early age when my father had this uh, thing from uh, his time in Japan. He was stationed uh, with the Navy for six months in Japan, and he had a calendar or some, he had a, a silk painting of a woman in a rickshaw being pulled by a man and the, the moon hidden by the clouds, you know, and then some Chinese writing on the side, a poem. And uh, it was hanging on our wall. And when I was a kid, I would climb up on this chair and look at these characters and try to think, what can that possibly mean? You know, and I was like three or four years old and uh, my sister would look at it. And I told her, I'm going to learn to read that stuff one of these days. And so oh, wow. uh, over the years, uh, I have learned a fair bit of it, but... Uh, I still can't read a newspaper, you know, uh, yeah. but uh, neither can we. <laughs> that, was, that was a big uh, part of my interest. It grew as I grew up and uh, finally wound up there. But now culture shock to me was like uh, you're in a room and you can see where everything is and you start to walk across the room and you hit a wall that, you know, it should be three feet in front of you, but it's not, you just hit it. You know, it's like, <laughs> and, uh, then you got to the corner and you know, the corner is not quite there. It's over here, you know, uh, for me, a uh, part of it was what I called the pachinko twist. Pachinko you know, I knew, twist. Uh, I knew all these people who were always doing pachinko, you know, and you can see everywhere you go, they're doing pachinko. Yeah. So I asked one of them, it's like, well, why are you doing that? You know, do you win something? He says, oh, no, no. He says, you get these plastic coins, you know. <laughs> and I said, you play for that? And he was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And I gradually learned, you know, that, okay, you take those to this little window. I started seeing those windows and yep. realized, you take them over there and you slide them under this thing with this Venetian blinds in front of it, you know, and a hand comes out and, uh, and then you get money out of there. And I thought, oh, so that's what's going on. Yeah. But the thing is that, you know, the gambling is illegal in Japan. Yeah. Uh, and so they have to, uh, they have to have this tacit exchange program and everybody knows where the windows are. So it's very clear what's happening. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when no one talks about it. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's what I call the pachinko twist is that uh, this kind of blatantly illegal, massive, illegal yeah. thing happening and the society uh just twists it behind yeah. the curtain you know yeah. yeah turns a blind eye to open things that, that are obviously not supposed to be happening right they accept yeah it. yeah and uh so yeah the uh uchi and soto and the uh hmm. omote and ura thing uh i read uh, a, a nice book about that recommended by Peter Goldsberry. Oh, Peter Goldsberry, yeah. Yeah. It's called uh, The Japanese Self in Cultural Logic. Oh, um, I think I read that in college. I think that was, oh, written, yeah. that was written by somebody from Oahu, a Japanese lady who lives in Oahu, I think. Yeah, and, I, yeah I, she's I, Japanese, and she yeah. lives, though, in uh, Hawaii. Yeah. Uh, 
and she's an anthropologist. That's a, gr yeah. that was a great book. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that is very interesting. But, uh, you know, I really loved being in Japan in the early 90s. Uh, and uh, there's nothing like the beauty uh, that you can see there. Uh, you know, the way you can be accepted by the people and so at that at that time in Shizuoka, uh, was there a lot of foreigners at that time, or was it was it still very rare in that specific area? There were a good many, and uh, they had been around uh, some of them for a while, and uh, there were people that everybody knew. Uh, so they had a pretty well established uh, gaijin community there, mm. and uh, uh, there was a lot of community, and. Uh, I was mainly trying to keep my focus on the Yosekan Dojo. Mm. Uh, and part of the time I was there, 21 months, I was living in the dojo. Oh, wow. And, wow. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, it was incredibly interesting. But uh, being there at that time, you know, one day uh, I was in my room and I heard this dunk, dunk, and uh, the door slid open and sensei was standing there and he goes, Mo, Mata. And the Gulf War had just started. And oh, wow. uh, yeah, he wanted me to come in there and he had this book that he uh, wanted me to read. And it was uh, Japanese in one direction, you flip it over, it's English in the other direction, you know. So it was called George Bush, Skull and Bones and the New World Order. <laughs> 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 And, uh, a great read. Was that a <laughs> yeah, conspiracy and, book? What was that? <laughs> uh, yeah, it was. Yeah, that's what it was. Uh, uh, <laughs> a summary of those things, and uh, and so I did read it. You know, and it's like, wow, I didn't know this stuff. You know, it was, uh, <laughs> they translated yeah, it to uh, Japanese. <laughs> they wow. had it in both. Yeah, and, and I believe it was some organization that he was kind of. Uh, he followed their publications or something, and uh, I think they came out with this one, and uh, he got a copy, I think. Hmm. Uh, it would be interesting to see that book again. So. <laughs> yeah. so actually, I have a good question for you. So if people, uh, some, some of our listeners maybe are not well-versed in martial arts, um, Uchideshi is basically like a living student. So you live in at the dojo, you, you, you're basically... Uh, do everything that the dojo needs. You 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 train all the time. You take care of the dojo. You take care of the sensei and stuff. Uh, so, f what was your experience? You were there for twenty one months. That's an, an extremely intense uh, time to be to be there. I mean, you, you're training every day. I don't think you had an off day. Probably, you, I don't. Know, I'm not sure if you had an off day. You had to train seven days a week, whatever. But what was your experience being in Uchideshi? That's a very unique experience. Well, uh, yes, I. Uh had already lived in dojos myself or at least one dojo. And uh, I lived in it for about two years. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, because uh, it was that or uh, an apartment, you know? And uh, and so I decided I would live in my dojo and, uh, and I slept on my mats for about two years. And uh, so uh, I was really used to just training all the time because I had been teaching all the time. And uh, so I went over there and I was training as much as I could. I kept a little book uh, and wrote down each day how many hours of whatever it was I did. I was doing Aikido, Judo, Karate, and uh, they didn't regularly offer sword training, but uh, sometimes they would do it. And uh, I often got in on that. But uh, as to being a Uchideshi, you know, uh, I would always ask Sensei, is there anything I can do to help? And uh, and sometimes he would have something for me to do. And uh, But, uh, you know, I had a job uh, teaching English, and that was a 40-hour-a-week job. Uh, and he had some other people that lived there, and they had jobs. And uh, so there were a lot of people around to do things there. Uh, but, uh, one thing that I noticed, uh, he had all these, uh, certificates and plaques, uh, hanging in his dojo. And, uh, although we would get up the, uh, the tatami every year and, uh, 
clean everything, take them up and clean the floor underneath and everything. And uh, nobody ever looked at those plaques and photographs and certificates that he had on the walls. If you ever see the mm. pictures of the dojo there, he had just a wall, three walls with these certificates and things. I think he had a prime minister of uh, the president of uh, France gave him a medal of honor or some kind of wow. Honor. Uh, a certificate of some kind and he ended up there and uh, had all these things up on his wall and I looked behind them and there was like this much dust <laughs> on the back of all these uh, <laughs> certificates. So everything else in the dojo had been cleaned year after year but these d things had been touched in all these years and so uh, I didn't say anything to anybody uh, I just started taking them down and cleaning them off and putting them back you know, and I just was out there for a long time. I just happened to have this time this one day and I noticed it. So I said, well, I'm going to clean those things off. I took every one of these things down off the walls and took them to the window and held them out the window and dusted them in this. It was a, a road where trucks came by. And so mm -hmm. there's a lot of dust out there. So I dusted these uh, things off and put them back up on the wall. While I'm working on this, uh, much as sensei, came downstairs and he came back through and he stopped and he looked and he saw what I was doing and he, he gave me this thumbs up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. He, I've been waiting for somebody to do that for years. <laughs> yeah. And he, he went on up to the dojo, you know. Yeah. Uh, so he did tell somebody once when I was there, you know, I like this guy. He's always asking, you know, is there something I can do? And, uh, you know, he, he had to correct me and tell me what he wanted me to say for what I meant in that case. I was asking some question that seemed strange. So he says, uh, to say, uh, and uh, he wanted me to say it that way instead of, uh, I think I'm saying, <laughs> I don't know what the hell it meant. You know? <laughs> Uh, I always would uh, around my parents and my grandparents, my grandfather, I always say to him, you know, is there anything you need or is there anything I can do for you? Actually, it's, that's what my father would always say when I would, uh, is there anything you need? And so I kind of picked that up from him. And so when I'm in Japan, then yeah. uh, I just treated him like my grandfather because uh, I was living there with him. Yeah. And uh, I'll tell you, it was uh, an amazing idea, though, to see this guy that age with his elderly wife, and they live in this uh, upstairs of an old school building, and there's a long kitchen with long sink, uh, and a lot of cooking went on there, uh, but they're just in this little two rooms, and there's people from all over that are all up in that area uh, all the time, and uh, that they could live with you know, no more privacy than that. And to receive all these people from all over the world, uh, just amazing to think, you know, but since they uh, could sleep, you know, and uh, uh, they seemed comfortable, but, you know, he would uh, snore and the building, you know, would kind of resonate and <laughs> thinking back on it, you know, it's kind of like being in a Miyazaki movie, you know, uh, <laughs> You can almost see the, the walls kind of move with his breathing and, and his breath was like. Uh, <laughs> and, and you could hear this and, and it would resonate in that room, kind of like in a guitar box, you know, yeah, a plywood wall and then my room and it's a little closed plywood room basically. So it would resonate and, uh, and uh, wow, it's really interesting that he would, you know, give up so much and his wife would give up so much of an idea of having their own real personal space to live like yeah. that. And people from all over the world came there and, uh, and they were treated nicely there. Hmm. Being immersed in uh, the Japanese culture like that and then of course, knowing the American culture, is there anything we can give and take, we can learn from each other's cultures? Like what's one of the bigger things you think American oh, people question. can learn and Japanese people can learn? Well, uh, 
Yeah, I got married uh, while I was there and uh, and had that first wife and we really were not really very well suited. <laughs> and we, we wound up getting divorced after we came wow. back over here. I had met her just before I came to Japan and uh, then we kind of uh, uh, gradually decided to get married while I was there and uh, we had two daughters and a uh, very rocky relationship. Mm -hmm. But I did learn a lot more about Japanese culture through that experience. And uh, a few years later, I guess about six years or maybe even eight years after that marriage ended, uh, I married another Japanese woman. And uh, so that went uh, for almost 10 years. And uh, I have a 16 year old son and two daughters in their twenties. And uh, the older one just turned 30. And so they're all uh, Japanese, American, Japanese, Caucasian. Uh, so I, you know, kind of get homesick for Shizuoka sometimes. Uh, to me, the big thing about Japan probably uh, is Zen. And I spent uh, a lot of time in Zazen meditation. And um, I paid my most attention to Shunryu Suzuki. Oh, uh, yes. The Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. That's a great book. And uh, to me... Uh, that's uh, that's the, the essence of things. And it puts you in a position where you know that you're you're equal with everybody uh, and that you're not superior to others uh, mm. and you don't have to be overawed by somebody who is you know nominally superior to you, you know uh, everybody is uh, you know, everything is nothing. Uh, and knowing that uh, the present moment is the whole thing. And Suzuki talked about uh, that you're not doing Zazen to achieve enlightenment, but you're just doing it to express your Buddha nature. And, uh, you know, that's something that is talking about an early influence was uh, my father had brought back that uh, picture with the writing on it that made me want to learn Japanese. But he also, there was a photograph of him in Kamakura and uh, he's looking at the camera and behind him is the giant Buddha. And uh, I asked my mother, who is that? And she says, that's Buddha. And uh, she had this brother that everybody called Buddy. And so I kind of thought that this Buddha is like Buddy. And so he's like an uncle or something. And my father, <laughs> My father's there with him, you know, and so this is somebody we know, and uh, he's, he's somewhere, you know, and so after that, it always stuck with me uh, very strongly, and I had a real affinity for Buddhism, and uh, and I don't know, uh, it's hard to say what uh, Americans might need to learn about anything. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, so... But what the Japanese, uh, I don't know what Japanese need to learn. Just, uh, you know, they, everybody, they, when I was there, everybody was trying to make it cool and, uh, and, and happy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know. Uh, so they need to learn to relax for sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if I were at all wise, I would not drink as much. Uh, uh, if I went back, I wouldn't be drinking. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can look back. I shouldn't have, uh, but I never drank really until I went to Japan the first time in 1986 and, and went to the Yosekon and trained there. And, uh, all the time everybody's like, Oh, we're so glad you're here. Have some more beer. And, and I never did really drink until I, I went there and then I participated and, and did, uh, with everybody. And then after that, when I came back home, uh, I was only there for a month, but I had uh, started associating beer with having a lot of good fun, you know. <laughs> so I started drinking a lot. Uh, and uh, so 
for the next 30 years, basically I drank. And then, uh, about four years ago, I said, I'm, I will knock this off, you know, and, and uh, haven't been drinking all these time. Oh, time wow. and, uh, nice. Well, good for you. Yeah. Uh, I'll get there uh, one day. Yeah, <laughs> uh, He's a young man, so. Well, my father always used to say, you know, uh, some folks don't learn till they hit rock solid bottom, you know, and I was like, well, maybe I need to get there, you know, you just I'm going to go and hit rock solid bottom. And not yeah. just because, uh, not in terms of drinking, you know, yeah. but in, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, life, you know, get to the yeah. rock solid bottom, you know, yeah. and, yeah. and you, I don't know if you guys ever played Minecraft, you know, but uh, <laughs> uh, getting down to the bedrock level, you know, and finding diamonds and stuff. And if you're uh, an architect or something, you build a building, you've got to build it on bedrock, you know, so mm rock solid bottom bedrock you know uh Start over again to me you know they're they're the same thing uh so yeah if if everybody would just you know just yeah, they, care, they do need to time. stop <laughs> yeah japanese culture they drink a lot they, they have all the nomikais and everything so man i used to bad. really love them Great places to eat. And, yeah, yeah. Is it and kind of have that all you can drink system, no fighting. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had a place. Uh, I had I had a little apartment near the dojo at some point before I moved in to live at the dojo. Uh, I was living at this place just uh, almost across the street. And one of the black belts there, a real nice guy, uh, he's says let's go drinking you know and so i took him to this place that mochizuki sensei said was a true old style japanese restaurant and uh they were my friends there uh and i still hear from them but uh we go over there we get this place and we drink beer and sake i don't know what all i i, I learned to not drink them together but uh we drank <laughs> a lot and uh, and then we were going back and we stopped at this other place that's just right down the street from the dojo and we drank some more. And so we're about to leave. And so I said to the guy, look, my place is right here, you know, and you, there's room for you. You can just sleep there tonight because, you know, you're pretty wasted. And he said, no, no, no. <laughs> and many times then during the night, he's, uh, you foreigners have never out drunk me. <laughs> So, <laughs> so, so I kept encouraging him to uh, not drink more and to come on and uh, and to not drive home. And so he refused. And then the next time I saw him, he saw me and he goes, you. you. I said, what? Goes, I got a ticket after drinking with you. <laughs> It's not my fault. <laughs> yeah, and I told him, I told you, yeah. man, I told you stay at my place, you know. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, uh, and you're seeing a lot of these uh, young salary men, you know, and mm -hmm, passed out on the way to the subway and stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's crazy. But, you know, that's just uh, part of it. Uh, I don't think, I remember some of the, uh, the Shihan at the dojo didn't drink and you know, it was, it was never, it was uh, non-obtrusive. It was just uh, natural. Yeah. So yeah. it's just up to what you want to do. But uh, I, uh, I probably would not drink as much. If I, <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, I think that goes for me too, probably. <laughs> yeah. I got a few more years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot more embarrassing times for you, Chad. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so actually, I actually have a good question for you. So, um, I, so we we always ask our guests any interesting or funny or strange things that you you've experienced in Japan. Like, what, what are some things that you that happened or you saw that were just bizarre or funny, like out of the ordinary? Well, uh, one of the big things that is that uh, I was uh, calling home and talking to a friend. And he told me this stuff about this politics with the Aikido organization I was involved with. And, uh, and it really made me extremely mad. And, um, and as I went home into my little apartment I had then, uh, 
I just got madder and madder, you know, and I thought, man, this is just no good. And I realized the reason I'm getting mad is that I have this fear that those people can actually do this thing that the guy said they were going to do. And I thought, okay, so the anger is not a problem. You know, it's that I have a fear here. And Richard uh, Kim had written about this uh, teacher that took his students out into this uh, cemetery and made them uh, practice with their bow uh, because one of them said he wasn't afraid of ghosts, you know, so he put him out in this, this cemetery and, uh, and these guys, uh, the, the, the guy who said he wasn't afraid of ghosts, he ran and never came back. And uh, so I thought, well, you know, I want to deal with this anger that I've got here. Oh. And since the anger is based in fear, I thought I need to go do something. And I thought, well, I'll go uh, train in a graveyard, you know. And so I thought I'll go up to this mountain behind where I lived. And uh, there's a trail through the woods and uh, there's a Zen temple at the top. Mm. And so I thought I'll go in there and go in the cemetery part and, and sit down and do Zazen in the cemetery. And so I walked up this trail through the dark and no lights of any kind up there, just whatever filtered down between the trees, you know, and uh, roots across the trail and uh, pine straw and stuff and drop offs, you know, uh, cliffs. And uh, wow. so, yeah. <laughs> and, Dangerous. And I was really mad too. You know? I, was, uh, <laughs> I was going up this mountain in the dark like that. And, uh, and I got up to the uh, temple there and the gate was locked, you know, so I couldn't do anything. And so I said, well, I thought maybe I could climb over the wall. You know, I thought, yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I just sat down in the gate of the temple there and did Zazen uh, sitting in Seiza, uh on the concrete pad there and uh, sitting like this, you know, and looking off and it's just black out there sitting like this for a long time and so finally i said man if i'm going to face my fear you know i guess i must have done it because you know it's still now you know so i said okay i'm going home and so uh, i got up and I'm, I'm going home going down toward the trail in the forest that leads down and all of a sudden i hear in the trees this that's like ah i almost what was that <laughs> yeah, my impulse, I couldn't tell if it's a person, an animal, or some kind of a bird, you know. Yeah, it's a scared I, monk. <laughs> and I got I got the sense that it might have been some of the local people that knew I was up there uh, and were trying to scare me. And then somebody screamed or something screamed. And my impulse was to run, you know, and, and get yeah. the hell out of there. But then I thought, yeah, there's drop-offs everywhere. You know, there's cliffs up here. And so then I just thought, you know, it's like I'm carrying a sword and I got like one point, you know, and, and you, Jamie, you know, the, the one point, you know? yeah. 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 So, uh, Safe and weak thing. Not everybody does that, but you got the old Hawaii, uh, Tohei Aikido. Tohei, uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, plus, yeah. So I felt my center and like, I have a sword in, you know, in my belt, you know, on the left, I just kind of kept walking, you know, it's like, you know, you might still scare me, you know? And, uh, <laughs> And then uh, after a couple of steps, it's like, yeah. <laughs> and it, 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 it struck me again. But then I'm like, uh, okay, this, no, they're just trying to scare me. And they did it one more time. And I just kept on walking down that trail down into the forest and, uh, and uh, went back down to my house, you know. But that <laughs> was the moment that I had to face fear because that first scream, that chilled my blood. Yeah. I <laughs> And I almost ran, you know, and I uh, thought, yeah, I'm glad I. So that training. Uh, salary, man. It's <laughs> yelling. This guy yeah. is sitting yeah. here. <laughs> I'm going to yell at him. <laughs> I have an appointment to do Zazen. <laughs> Open up. So, uh, yeah, other than that, uh, you know, uh, being there and being among the people and learning. Uh, language and uh and then seeing some of the uchi side uh rather than the soto and, yes yeah and some of the ura as well as the omote uh and and of course as that implies you know not all of it was real positive yeah uh, and yeah. uh and i uh felt 
from that idea, you know, that you're in a room, but the real room is invisible and it's turned uh, and, and it's a different place than where you see it. You know, mm. you keep hitting these invisible barriers and that's culture shock to me uh, is that you think you see what it is, but it's really not that way at all. And you, you, know, you reach for something and you bump into something because yeah. you don't really understand how it really is. You can't yes. really see it straight. Uh, that's, a, uh, that's a great analogy. So uh, the stress of that, you know, uh, has its place, uh, but you get to see behind some of those invisible screens. Uh, one time, somehow this guy came to the dojo and when I and my American compatriots uh, finished training, he invited us to go uh, on this car drive with him. And uh, he apparently had this uh, steel company or steel mill or something. And he's really rich. And uh, his name was Mochizuki, uh, but he wasn't a direct relation. I don't know. They say in Shizuoka, you can throw a rock and either an Uno or a Mochizuki will say, ouch. <laughs> but uh, so this guy's rich and he takes us uh, to his home and I'm sure he must have given us something to eat or something. And he was just really treating us, you know, and I never could figure out what in the world is with him. You know, it's maybe he was looking for investors or something. Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know what he was, uh, but he takes us to this place and he's got a sword master there and he has all these uh, little sets of uh, Japanese armor. And wow. they're talking about, ordinarily uh, a citizen would not be allowed. Oh, he had this guy that was with him and it was like something out of, uh, you know, the old film noir, this character who's uh, the toady. And he, he's like, Oh, ordinarily a person could not have this kind of armor, but <laughs> certain people. Yeah are allowed to have it, you know, I mean, he's pointing at the other guy, like, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's, like, the, he's uh, the man. He's the man. <laughs> yeah. And so this sword master has got this uh, thing and, and he takes the, the helmet and the little face plate thing. And somehow or other, he takes that off and, uh, and he lets us look at it. And then he can't get the face thing back on the helmet. And he's like, Arr. and he's having problems with it, you know. And so I said, uh, let me see it. <laughs> and he hands me this <laughs> old helmet and I snapped it back in. I said, oh, there you go. <laughs> and, uh, and he gave it back to him, you know. So this guy is a sword master of some kind. And, and he's dealing with this ancient armor that supposedly should be in a museum. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't still didn't know why are we here, you know, and uh, and then that happened, and uh, and then uh, they took us back to the dojo, and then I never saw that guy again, you know. Oh wow! And it was like I still don't know why were we there, you know. <laughs> uh, Just a random may, crazy moment. It may be that he was one of those people that would come by and get people from the dojo to kind of show them. Uh, it may have been that he had some kind of jealousy about Mochizuki Sensei. Uh, strange things happen. Because yeah. you put him to shame. He's like, damn, this gaijin had to fix my armor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go in solitude for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're not and, coming back and showing me my stuff anymore. <laughs> and the, the toady comes up to the, uh, the sword master. He says, oh... <laughs> <laughs> I have to oh. tell you, someone wants you to commit seppuku. The guy sitting there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's so weird. They they always have like that that macho stance, like mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that was one of those really bizarre things. Uh, and so, yeah, it, there's just uh, endless opportunity for that. Um, mm. And uh, I often think I'd like to get back over there. Uh, yeah, man. Come to Hokkaido. Yeah. Nice and cold. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm freezing down here in Alabama right now. <laughs> uh, actually, right now, I'm pretty comfortable. The heater's not even on. Uh, but we've nice. had this kind of Arctic blast come through. Uh, My friend says, what is this weird sorcery? It's snowing. I said, well, it's early December, you know. And uh, <laughs> people, we don't really usually get much snow at all. But uh, every now and then, we just get uh, slamming with the uh, a good bit of snow and because of the mountains around here and the, the way the freeways are made uh when we have much uh snow and ice uh, it becomes un unpassable you yeah. just can't get around this area yeah yeah i still i used to live in georgia so i know i understand how that goes through right. sup sup horo dosanko life all right let's go all right so uh, this is our this or that. So I'm going to ask you some questions. Just choose one. All right. Uh, Budweiser or Asahi Super Dry? Uh, Asahi. <laughs> Asahi. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say Budweiser. Oh, that's not even a choice, dude. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like the two choices. <laughs> that's like the it's American like Seifu it, and the it, Japanese like Seifu. Water or beer, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, Shiva's or, Regal or Suntory? <laughs> Which one? Sh Shiva's Shiva. Regal or Suntory? <laughs> I'll go with Suntory. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, ramen or Udon? Uh, udon. Udon. Oh, udon's yeah, good. Shizuoka's famous, right, for their Udon? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, unagi or Fugu? Unagi. unagi. Oh, Have you ever friend, tried like... Fugu? Uh, yeah, sometime it's one of those little fast places. Uh, uh, I had to assume it must be safe. Uh, <laughs> they should have like yeah, a death count. Yeah, how many people it, died from your store shop? Don't, don't buy fugu from a back back uh, back street place. But my friend, uh, the sensei said it was a real traditional Japanese restaurant. Uh, it was an unagi ya, uh, uh, and, and I spent a lot of time there. Uh, Nice. Good good place for me to learn about Japan and Japanese uh, culture. Yeah. Nice. Um, raw fish or fried fish? Uh, I guess uh, sashimi. Sashimi. Yeah, sashimi, man. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite sashimi? Uh, maguro. Maguro? Maguro. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. Uh, sake or shochu? Uh, you know, I was watching these uh Zatoichi movies, he drinks sake out of a bowl, you know, and yeah. so I thought, well, I'll join uh Zato tonight and I'll join Ichi and I'll drink out of a bowl. And it's like, <laughs> 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 so I don't know. uh, yeah, I, I had a little too much, I, I quit drinking sake out of the bowl, but uh, <laughs> uh right. you know, I, I liked them both. Uh, Hard Sana, choice. Chochu, Sawa, and uh, Lemon, and all those. Uh, that's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can't Today's choose. Sake. You can't choose? All right. Yeah, I mean, uh, Both. it's a draw. Yeah, it's uh, part of the big picture. You got to have them both. All right. The next one, maybe I wonder if you're going to choose one. Um, so, which discipline would you choose? Aikido, Karate, or Judo? Uh, in different times of life, the different ones, I, I would have liked to have had a much more uh, deeper background in judo uh, because uh, I found the people that could really go somewhere with Aikido, uh, they understood judo and Mochizuki Sensei could just teach them very fluidly. Uh, so judo is good for a foundation and, uh, and karate is good for striking, but the overall master art for me is Aikido. Hmm. It's like a combination of both. Yeah, also it's, depends it's, what kind of Aikido. Yes, yeah. but it uh, it is the central and essential thing that makes the others uh, very easy to work with. Mm. Mm. Okay, and the last one. So, if you were betting on a fight, a prize fight, who would you choose, Van Damme or Steven Seagal? Mm. In their prime. Mm. <laughs> I, I I was for Tyson the other night and uh, bah, he looks good. Did you watch it? 
uh, I didn't, wasn't able to see it, but I saw, you know, some uh, related video and, uh, mm. and I never did really like John Jones and, uh, and <laughs> oh, Roy Jones kind of oh, Roy Jones, right? Roy Jones. Okay. So that's not the guy who did the uh, showboating all the time. In, in, I mean, John Jones is the UFC fighter, but Roy Jones so, is the boxer. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Uh, so I can take that off of his uh, his card. That uh, yeah. now it's a gallon sub. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, no bets. <laughs> yeah, but just yeah, yeah. Uh, now nah, when we wouldn't. have it, <laughs> Chuck, Chuck Norris. Chuck, uh, they, <laughs> yeah. I think actually Van Damme fought in some actual prize fighting competition before. But uh, yes, yeah, supposedly in uh, Belgium under a different name, he had a record uh, of some fighting. But uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> still no no bet. <laughs> uh, you know I I I, I just can't. <laughs> <laughs> all right it's it's like hillary or trump you know i don't really i don't really dislike uh van damme uh, and i don't really have any animosity for seagal uh you just can't bet on one no no uh, <laughs> all right uh that's all i got so uh thanks thanks for doing the podcast right. thanks for joining us thank you for having me yeah, this is great it's interesting this is great I'm, yeah i enjoyed it very much uh yeah I'm get homesick for japan now and then and uh i'd like to get back and see shizuoka again sometime yeah well if you come please come to hokkaido too man well you can come during the summer we have the better yeah. summer all right yeah for awesome you spring got, you gotta go to that uh monk temple again and just start yelling <laughs> yeah. start yelling at the monks you remember me <laughs> the older ones <laughs> hide behind something I'm gonna call you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah yeah i'd like to get back there and uh and just see the that kanon statue at the top of the the mountain there that view of the uh surugo wan oh that sounds beautiful i'd like to hit down there yeah well, thank right. you very much. Enjoyed oh, it. Thank you. Uh, appreciate no, it. No, thank you. It was great. It was yeah. finally nice to meet you since we were Facebook yeah. friends. And I've been reading uh, about you on IQ Web for many years. So thank you. Thank yeah. you for coming. All right. Well, mahalo. And, Peace uh, out, mahalo. Yoroshiku onegaishimasu. Yoroshiku. Oh, thank you. All right. Shoots. Good night. Good night. All right.